All right. So tonight, the title of my sermon is The Wiles of the Devil. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. And while you're turning to Matthew chapter 4, let me read Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, which says, Finally, my brethren, am I on? I don't think so. Okay, Ephesians 6, 10 through 11 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So a wile is basically a trick. It's something laid in your way to deceive you. Um, who knows the Looney Tunes? Wiley Coyote. He, uh, he always laid traps out there for the roadrunner. Um, he tried to entice the roadrunner into these snares so he could catch him. And if you think about it, that's all that the devil can do to us. He can make you blind to God's blessings, or maybe he can take away your earthly possessions, possessions like he did with Job. But looking at the big picture, his goal is just to get your eyes off of Jesus Christ. Um, his goal is to make it to where you won't serve him because you'll be looking around at the world. His goal is to make you blind to eternity and get you all worried about everything going on around you. But if you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, and if you stay faithful through your trials, the devil has no more power than Wiley Coyote does against the roadrunner. So Satan's attacks are called the wiles of the devil. And we have two places in the Bible where we see the devil directly attack somebody. Um, so, you know, Daniel and Job, they were attacked by the devil, but they didn't directly interact with him like these two places we're about to look at. So the first place is where the devil attacked Jesus Christ, spiritually tempting him, after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. So if you found your spot in Matthew 4, uh, stand with me while we read verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> and it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward unhungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to preach. Um, I ask you to bless the message. Please open our hearts to your word and apply it to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. So I want y'all to, to think about this, what we just read, that the devil's main form of attack, the devil's primary wile, is to undermine the words of God. All right? So I'm going to go through each of the verses here in Matthew 4, but first I want to look at the second place where the devil directly attacks somebody, and that's back in Genesis chapter 3. So turn with me to Genesis 3. Hold your place here in Matthew 4. So Genesis 3, I'm going to read 1 through 7. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. 
And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. All right, so I want y'all to notice in verse one here, the first word out of the devil's mouth is what? He says, yay. <laughs> that means yes. So that's the power of positive thinking right there. Words of affirmation. Yay. And then he says, hath God said? So the first thing the devil does is he's questioning the word of God. Yay, hath God said? Did God really say this? Now, during Eve and the serpent's discussion, they both try to quote God's original command to Adam. Flip back one page to Genesis 2, 15 through 17. <clears throat> and I'm going to read that real quick. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. All right, so y'all stay here and take a look at verse 16. And I'm going to reread uh, Eve and the serpent's quotations of this command. So the serpent said, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. But that's not the way that God said it. God said, of every tree thou mayest freely eat. But the serpent spun it around and claimed God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. But that's not what he said. So the serpent spun God's positive statement into a negative one. But he also took away one of God's words. Did anybody notice that? What word is that? He completely removes the word freely. Okay. God said, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Satan took that word completely out. Okay? Listen to what Eve said in verse 2. She said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. She, she still said it in that positive sense like God said. It was a lot closer to what God originally said. But she also took away the word freely. She removed one of the words of God. What else did she mess up? In verse 3, she says, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. Did God say anything about touching it in chapter 2? No. Now, that probably wasn't a bad boundary to say, Oh, let's, let's not touch this fruit. But God didn't say that. He said, Don't eat it. And the thing is, she said, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. So she's claiming God said not to touch it, but God never said that. She's adding to the word of God. All right. <clears throat> and then she altered God's word. In 2.17, God said, thou shalt surely die. That's pretty clear. It's like the Ten Commandments, all the thou shalt nots. It's crystal clear. There's no question about it. But what Eve quoted God as saying was lest ye die neither shall you touch it lest ye die so that's basically saying the same thing but I think the original command thou shalt surely die has a lot more power than lest ye die you see what I'm saying so Eve added to God's word she removed from God's word and then she jumbled up and changed God's word I believe Eve made herself wide open to the devil's attack because she was not careful with God's word. She took the liberty to mess with what God said, and the devil took no time at all to slither up and beguile her. Now, God originally gave the command in chapter 2 to Adam, and you could argue that, well, Adam jumbled it up. You know, it was the telephone game. Eve, Eve was just going off of what Adam told her. We, we don't know, but that's not the point. The point is that God's word was not held to be precious 
His words were not safely hidden in Eve's heart. So the serpent came and attacked by questioning God's word. 1 Timothy 2.14 says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And like a domino effect, sin came into the world, and that first domino was Eve being very loose with God's word. So look at what the serpent said. His first words were, Yea, hath God said. Then in verses 4 and 5, after Eve let her guard down by altering the word of God, the devil just tells an outright lie. He says, ye shall not surely die. That's false. The day that they ate of that fruit, Adam and Eve spiritually died. The devil is a liar. Jesus said in John 8, 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. This wily serpent came along and questioned God's word. He came and planted seeds of doubt about whether God was telling the truth. He made Eve think she must have been missing out, that God was holding her back from good. But what's the truth? Mankind never had a better state than there in the Garden of Eden. We've never had anything as good. And just as a side note, um, a lot of psychologists, they try to claim that, well, you know, the reason that bad people do bad things is because they grew up in a bad environment, you know? Uh, the, the axe murderer, he, his parents talked bad to him, so that's, that's why he's bad. That's why he's evil. But that's not what the Bible portrays. Adam and Eve had a perfect environment, and they sinned. Um, the prodigal son... He had a pretty awesome dad, didn't he? Gave him his whole inheritance early, and he loved him when he came back. But that prodigal son went out to party and fornicate and live it up in the big city. And then there's the opposite. Mary Magdalene, she came to Jesus the first time. She had seven devils, devils cast out of her, but she's the first one Jesus appeared to after he rose again. Or the woman at the well, she had five husbands. But she was the first person that Jesus was soul winning to right before that huge revival in Samaria. Those two ladies had some pretty awful upbringings, but they had their whole lives turned around because they met the Lord. They laid everything down before Him. They came as empty vessels to Jesus Christ, laying everything down at His feet. So your environment does not determine who you are. Um, so what can we learn here so far? Imagine the next time that the devil comes to you with a temptation. He slithers up to you and he plants these seeds of doubt in your mind, questioning whether God's way is best or if he's holding back from you fun and pleasure and living like the rest of the world. That's not the time to start misquoting the Bible or changing God's word. That's when you pull out your Bible and you go to something that's already underlined and highlighted. You read every single word. Or you pull out your phone and you search up exactly what God says about the sin you're being tempted with. Or the promises He's made that He's going to lead you to good and not evil. Eve was tempted to sin after she changed God's Word. So let's turn back to Matthew chapter 4. In verses 3 and 4, it says, And when the tempter came to Him, He said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Satan first tempts Jesus to immediately gratify his flesh. And notice that he says, If thou be the Son of God. This is pretty similar to, Yea, hath God said? He's questioning whether this is true. And Jesus combats this temptation by quoting Scripture. He says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He quotes scripture that he had already hidden in his heart. Verses 5 uh, says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, once again he's questioning, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So what's the devil do here? 
he is the one quoting scripture this time. He comes to Jesus, tries to tempt him to make stones into bread, and Jesus quotes the Bible right back at him. So then what's the devil do? He starts trying to quote scripture to tempt Jesus. But let's look at what Satan was quoting. He's quoting Psalm 91. Turn there real quick with me. Psalm 91. Psalm 91, verse 11, says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. The context of this is Satan is taking this future prophecy about Jesus. In the future, after the great tribulation, Jesus is going to return to the earth and set up a physical, visible kingdom of heaven with his throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's the context of this prophecy in Psalm 91. Look at verse 13, which the devil conveniently left out. It says, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. The Lord is going to bruise Satan's head. He's going to tread on the roaring lion, that's the devil, and the adder. He's going to trample the dragon. Revelation 22 says that Satan is bound up in the bottomless pit for Jesus' 1,000 year reign. Do you see the correlation the, of him trampling under feet the, the dragon? That's the context that Satan forgot to mention. So what Satan is doing is he's taking this future doctrinal truth and he's trying to pull it back to 2,000 years ago and say, oh, apply this scripture to today. But there was a 2,000 year gap, right? At least. <laughs> so if you look at what Jehovah's Witnesses believe, they claim that the best of Jehovah's Witnesses are 104th and same, Russian 7, Revelation 10. They're taking you trophy and dragging it back to today misapplying it to today. Look at what Pentecostals believe. They take the signs for the unbelieving Jews. 1 Corinthians says uh, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but the Jews require a sign. And elsewhere in 1 Corinthians it says that tongues are for a sign to the unbelievers. So they're taking these signs that were for the book of Acts and they're dragging them forward to today. What do atheists and agnostics and humanitarians all believe? They want to make the world a better place and bring global peace to this earth. But that's only going to happen when Jesus Christ is on the throne. That's a true future prophecy. There will be global peace one day. But they're trying to drag it back to today and set that up without Jesus Christ. But there's no peace without the Prince of Peace. So whenever the devil quotes scripture, if he doesn't change the words, he's going to misapply it. He's going to rip it out of its context. Let's look at another example of this in Matthew 3. In Matthew 3, verse 11, Pentecostals, Charismatics, they use this verse. It says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So they say, look at that, the baptism of fire. That's where you're getting real spiritual in a church service and you start hollering, you start shouting, you start losing control of your body, and you start babbling in unknown tongues. Is that what the baptism of fire is? They're taking this verse out of context. Look at verse 10. And now also the axe is laid unto the roots of the trees. Therefore, every good, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The baptism of fire is the lake of fire. It's hell. So that's just an example of what can happen whenever you just completely rip a verse out of context. And that's what the devil will do. 
So the first while of the devil is to add, subtract, or change the word of God. And his second tactic here that we see is that he misapplies doctrinal truths and he gets prophecy all tangled up. He rips things out of context. The third tactic or while of the devil is that he changes the subject when he's proven wrong. Look at how Jesus answers each of these temptations directly and he sharply rebukes him just by quoting the scripture. Does the devil sit there and debate with Jesus and try to say, well, no, he doesn't do any of that. He, he jumps to another topic. He doesn't say, well, I guess I was wrong. He just, he just jumps away. And whenever we're out door knocking and we're talking to someone who isn't just unsaved, but someone who's an unsaved heretic, a wolf in sheep's clothing, what do they do whenever we bring very clear scriptures completely opposite of what they're saying? They just jump on to the next thing. They jump to the next thing. Jump, ju they jump over here, over there, over there. They never sit down and you can't pin them down. They're like a slimy, slippery snake. So uh, chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So Jesus again, he just quotes scripture right back in the devil's face. And verse 11 says, The devil leaveth him. James 4, 7 says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you cling to the word of God, you have nothing to fear even when you're face-to-face, toe-to-toe with the devil. Cling to the Word of God. So we're about to move to my next point, but first I want to point out a little tidbit about the devil's temptations here. Brother Archie quoted this this morning. 1 John 2, 15-16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the summary of the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The devil's three attacks on Jesus Christ can be summed up into that. Verse 3, he tempted him to make stones into bread. That's what the flesh wanted after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. That's tempting him with the lust of the flesh. Then in verse 5 and 6, he tells Jesus to go up into the highest part of the city, jump off. And let the angels catch you and carry you down. Do that for all the world to see that you're the Son of God. That's the pride of life. And then he takes him up to an exceeding high mountain and he tempts him to fall down and worship him. But how does he tempt him to do that? He shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. That sounds like the lust of the eyes. All right. So God has warned us not to change a single one of his words. God placed warnings all throughout the Bible about not messing with his book. And there are three main warnings in the beginning, middle, and end of the Bible. Let's look at the first one in Deuteronomy 4, 2. Uh, starting in verse 1. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you. For to do them, that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. The Lord said, Do not add to my word, and do not take away from my word. Then in Proverbs 30, Proverbs 30 verse 5, Proverbs 35 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. God says right here in the middle of the Bible, Do not add to my word. And then the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22. Revelation twenty two eighteen, the last warning that Jesus gives, he says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, 
God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. All right. So the modern Bible versions, or as I like to call them, the modern Bible perversions, they change the word of God all around. They do everything we saw the serpent and Eve do in Genesis 3. They add to the words of the Bible. Let's look at Luke, Luke 2, 3. Sorry, Luke 2, 33. Luke 2, 33 says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. The NIV and the ESV says, His father and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. They claimed that Jesus that Joseph was Jesus' father. But Jesus was the only begotten son of God. He was not Joseph, Joseph's son. Look at Colossians 3. Excuse me, Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1.13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Every modern Bible version says in verse 14, In whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. What do they change? They take out Christ's blood. There is no remission of sins without the blood of Jesus Christ. The modern versions twist around God's word and they change it. Who's heard of the straight and narrow? Better question is who hasn't heard of the straight and narrow, right? Look at Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 14. I'm going to start in verse 13. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The way to eternal life is straight and narrow. You have to come by the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on Calvary. You have to forsake your own righteousness and your own good works and trust completely in the righteousness of Jesus Christ to be saved and gain eternal life. That is the straight and narrow. It's very easy to be saved, but it is a very narrow way. You have to come God's way, and there's no other way but the one door, the one and only way is Jesus Christ. And look at verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. These wolves, they try to change that truth. They say, well, you've got to do good works. You've got to turn away from all your sins to be saved. That's a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's a damnable heresy. Well, who wants to hear what the New King James says in verse 14? It says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. It says that it's difficult to find eternal life. That's because the modern Bible versions support lordship salvation. They support this idea that you have to work all your life to be saved. Produce all manner of good works to prove that you're truly saved. The modern Bible support damnable heresy. And those three examples are just barely scratching the surface. I'd love to get more into some other examples, but it's all summed up in this. The legacy of the King James Bible is, thus saith the Lord. The legacy of the modern Bibles is, yea, hath God said? So my next point is that if you're saved, Satan will tempt you to doubt the authority of God's word. Turn to Psalm 12, 6-7. Jesus said that heaven and earth shall pass away, but his words would not pass away. And Psalm 12, 
verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God promised to preserve His words to every generation. That includes us. Do we have God's Word? Do you hold those words that Jesus Christ promised would never pass away? Many Christians today, most Christians today, have been completely disarmed. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is quick. That means it's living. It's alive. The Holy Spirit speaks to you through this Word. The Holy Spirit works on your heart as you read it. It's the only book where you read it and at the same time it's reading you. It discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Most Christians have swapped out this sharper than any two-edged sword book in exchange for a butter knife, the modern Bibles. You've got the unleavened bread of the Word of God. No sin, no impurity, nothing but the pure words of God. But modern Bibles are leavened and impure. Rat poison, did anybody know this? Rat poison is 99% nutritious. It's the 1% that will kill you. I was listening to this one preacher. Um, he was an ex-convict. And he served like 30 years in prison or something. And he was, he was saying this. He said, even cut dope will get you high. Cut dope, he's talking about drugs that are mixed with impurities uh, by drug dealers so they can rip the drug users off and sell more weight for less drug, basically. He says, even cut dope will get you high. You have to do more and the high will never be as good. But if I know where to get the pure stuff, take a tiny hit and it's like, whoa. That is what you've got in the pure, unadulterated King James Bible. <laughs> Maybe some of y'all don't like that example, but it's true. You want the real stuff. You want the pure, uncut Word of God. Modern Bibles aren't just 100% bad, but they can never be as good as the real thing. They don't even compare. But I want to say this. Even just using the King James Bible is not what it takes to be strong. Just knowing the words isn't what helps you. I don't ask this often to people, but I bet the 80% of lost people out, out of these walls today, I bet they could quote some of John 3.16. You know? They can quote the very verse that tells you how easy it is to be saved. Just believe. But does that make them saved? No. The problem is that they don't believe the words. And therefore, they cannot apply those words and call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Don't just use the King James. Believe it. Study until you can believe and trust every single word. It's God's word. Pray to Him and ask Him to prove it to you. And then my final point tonight is that if your faith in God's word is strong, Satan will tempt you to forget and to doubt God's promises. I'm sure most of us in here know there's something funny about the modern Bibles, right? And our faith is in God's King James Bible. And I praise God for that. I praise God for a church like this. I'm sure most of us in here believe the words of God. But that doesn't mean we're free from the wiles of the devil. He'll tell us a little sin won't hurt you when you know God's command is for you to stay away for your own good. As a Christian, the wiles of the devil are no different than for anyone else. When we go through trials and troubles, he plants seeds of doubt in our minds about God's goodness. If you're doing things right and trusting God by faith to get you through trials and tribulations, the devil comes along and says, that's not good enough. Your faith is not good enough. You've messed up and you've sinned. God's done with you. He's not going to pick up the pieces. You missed the boat. It's too late. I don't know about y'all. Maybe y'all have more faith than me. But when I'm going through a hard trial of doubt, I can get so wrapped up in my worry that I'm just constantly back and forth. One minute I'll be praising God for His blessings 
asking him for strength and praising him for the trials. And then the next minute, I'm immediately going back to doubting myself and doubting if I'm doing the right things, doubting if I'm just watching things crumble around me or if I'll make it through by the skin of my teeth to the other side. But notice what I said. I said that I'm doubting myself and my actions. And honestly, those doubts are completely valid because I can't overcome my trials. I can't say the right words and do all the right things all the time. I can't fix things when I slip up or say something that I shouldn't. I can't hold everything together when it seems like everything's falling apart. But God Almighty can. The devil wants to come along and make you doubt, forget or doubt God's rock-solid promises. Let me read a few of those promises from His Word. Romans 8.28. Brother Archie read this today. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. All things work together for good. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. All things work together for good. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. These are promises that we have to cling to in our trials. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high, pe high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The devil's wiles have not changed. He wants to steal the word of God away and make you forget that God is in control. Turn with me to two, two last places here. John 14, 27. John 14, 27. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And I have a note written in my Bible here. It says, Look around and be distressed. Look within and be depressed. Look at Jesus and be at rest. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Turn a couple pages over to Matthew, excuse me, John 16, 33. Jesus said, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He is already overcome and it's our faith in him that makes us overcomers. Now, uh, whenever I'm facing trials, there's a, there's a song I like, and uh, I'm not going to sing it. Y'all don't want to hear that, I promise. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a couple verses from it. This is the chorus, and then I'm going to read the last verse. It, the, some, the name of the song is, God Will Make This Trial a Blessing. And it says, God will make this trial a blessing, though it sends me to my knees. Though my tears flow like a river, yet in him there's sweet relief. There's no need to get discouraged. There's no need to talk defeat. God will make this trial a blessing and the whole wide world will see. And it goes through a couple verses like that. But then the last verse says, Now I'm standing on the mountain looking back and I can see. When I was in that lowest valley, his strong hand was leading me. Oh, it's good to see the sunshine and to, to taste sweet victory. God has made this trial a blessing. Oh, the grace he gives to me. So to summarize tonight, the wiles of the devil is that the devil tries to add to and subtract from the Bible. And he rips God's words out of context. He did this with Eve and he did it with the Son of God. And he's going to do it with you. What we should do to overcome this is to ask God to strengthen our faith in his word, 
and ask him to help us to believe every single word. And while we seek God to strengthen our faith in his word, we need to stand on his promises, have faith in all the wonderful things he's promised us, and remember to count our blessings. One man that came to Jesus to have his son healed cried out and said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. We can all have our faith strengthened tonight. So let's all stand and have a moment of prayer. Ask God for his mercy and grace.